live in shifting times. Now it's sunny outside, you know? So, uh, you got there early. It was raining, now it's sunny. Thank you for those kind words. Uh, it was just as if you indicated that having been the longest serving foreign minister, if I expressed myself wrong, I could be quickly departing. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> so let's see what we can do with that. But I thought I would, you know, allow myself, since we are, although we are in a uh, nice Oslo hotel, we are still at the university. We are still in the uh, NUPI uh, research uh, world where we should allow ourselves for some free reflection. Uh, I appreciate that we have representatives from the external action service here with us. Always good to see um, that we have this dialogue with uh, uh, Brussels institutions. I think what I would like to do is to speak pretty freely on, on how I see this um, lead up to your title, uh, Ulf Sverdrup, uh, on uh, Europe's crisis. And I think I will challenge, you know, in a way, two of your assumptions. One is the assumption that there is a crisis in European integration. One could argue rather to the contrary, that European integration has never been more needed, more relevant, more adequate than now. Yes, there is a crisis in banking. There is a crisis in uh, public uh, finances in several countries, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But is it right to extrapolate that to a crisis uh, in European integration? My thesis here will be the contrary. I think we are ahead of a leap forward in European integration. But what is going to be uh, politically so interesting is that it's going to be a leap which is not going to follow the traditional recipe that we have seen since post-World War II years. But we are standing on shaky ground always, you know, so one has to be careful. The second hypothesis is that Norway's relationship is complex. And my assertion will be it is not. And what we will see in my view, is an even closer Norwegian link to this European integration process by a number of factors which I think follow quite clearly from uh, fundamental interests, uh, which one day again could lead to questions being posed about what role we should play in this integration. So this runs a bit counter, I think, both, uh, both these uh, introductory remarks to what is commonly now asserted as we analyze things. Now, first reflection. Uh, clearly, the European integration process, as I see it, is up against some fundamental challenges in the sense that the European political context is so different. Um, some of you have heard me come back to a reflection on what we experienced when we approached Europe's integration in the late 80s and my own experience around that where I really felt that Europe, at that crossing point, early 90s, really discovered what Tony Jutt observes in his historic writings, that history has a tendency to come back and haunt Europe. I have a Serbian colleague who used to say that Serbia has too much history to digest. And sometimes it just comes back and reminds you that you know, history is still there and, and really means something. Just me, let me repeat that, that short experience. Some of you will remember that in the late 80s or mid 80s, after the decision was made to complete the internal market with the 300 different measures, this was observed in EFTA states as something that we had to relate to. Why? Well, because it has had been a completely non-controversial issue since the 1950s that the EFTA countries would really stay attuned with European integration when it came to standards and technical barriers to trade and making that market as level playing field from a technical point of view as possible. And we all discovered, and there was nothing political about it actually, that that method was running out of speed as Europe accelerated its process towards the internal market. And out of that came the idea of the European economic area as a more advanced way of securing a level playing field. But there was also one chapter which has been 
not very much analyzed, and that was the first kind of indications to the European Union from EFTA states about the option of membership. Diplomatic uh, uh, sounding out, not very official, but you know, what would be, what would be the reaction? And the response, which was so clearly that that is not the time. This is not the time. And the answer was, I think, that we, we being the 12 at the time, are now heading for deepening. And on the heels of that completing the internal market came the visions of the Economic and Monetary Union and a common foreign policy. I remember Maastricht was not really adopted and planned in 1992. It was voted over in 1992 in Denmark, but the plans are mid-80s, second half of the 80s, thinking. So my point here is that the conceptualization of that leap forward with the European integration, which is one we live with now, more or less, because the treaties that followed with Amsterdam and finally Lisbon, which is, yes, a step forward, but the concept, to me, is really around Maastricht. And Maastricht was conceptualized before the fall of the Berlin Wall. It was conceptualized while Europe was 12. And while Europe had the idea that we, the 12 of us, we are the ones who are sufficiently harmonized to do that leap forward. I have tested this personally on Jacques Delors afterwards, 10 years afterwards, uh, 15 years afterwards actually, 2005, 2006, and I think, I think the sequence is right. That in 87, 88, 89, the reflection on what they needed to accompany this market push was the vision of a political union that had to be conceptualized accordingly. And then the perspective of history coming, gliding, arrives with the fall of the Berlin Wall, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and all of a sudden, more or less, you have these new European democracies, vulnerable, in the belt between the East and the West, what to do. So whereas the discussion, as I remember it quite clearly, was should we opt for deepening or enlargement, ended up being a false discussion. Because in the meeting, the face of history, there was only one choice, both. And I have said, I think in this room, and it was controversial at the time, I'll repeat it, that would have merited a Nobel Peace Prize. But as you know, the Norwegian government never interferes with the Nobel Committee, so I can only stand here and <laughs> express it. I still believe it is very much so. Through political vision and great courage, the German Chancellor unified Germany with a common currency as a political project. And I think also, a bit more broadly, Europe, although NATO was the first to grasp that challenge, and I think some of my American colleagues at the time saying that why is not the European Union quickly absorbing these countries? We in NATO will start dealing with it, underestimated how exceedingly more complex it is to integrate into the European Union than into NATO under the circumstances. But there was Euro-Atlantic integration into NATO and into the European Union, which I believe is a huge and important event in the history of the continent. But it is exceedingly complex. So it was not as a matter of choice, but as a matter of necessity, and on that basis, the matter of courage, that Europe opted for that enlargement. Now, some of you have read Timothy Garton Ash's recent analysis on the crisis, and there are many ways to cut this cake, but he makes a somewhat similar entry into it, saying that we should never forget two critical elements of analysis when we watch societies, namely the aspect of generations, what generation, what cohorts make up the politicians, and what is the current political setting around those generations. And his point is, this which we all kind of le learn at school, to the extent that we learn anything about Europe at schools these days, that the generations who built this European integration process were all deeply marked by one or two world wars, one or two auto-destructions in Europe. So both of 
And so this element really mattered for the way they conceptualized the need for European integration with that very dramatic experience. So he emphasizes the, 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 the role of those generations for the shaping of texts and visions. And the other element was the presence of an external threat, which was clear and easy to read, namely the Soviet Union, the Warsaw Pact, the Cold War. So the combination of generations who had seen this, and he writes very vividly about the, the generations coming out of the new democracies, Many of those generations, Geremek, for example, had both experienced the Second World War and the communist years. A very driving force in the personal, you know, political landscape. And the existence of this threat. And then he comes to the point which adds to my point. Namely, that this comes on top of the change in the early 90s. Those generations are being phased out of politics for obvious reasons and the external threat is disappearing. So two key kind of sociological, geopolitical building blocks of European integration is just gradually vanishing out. Which I think is a very interesting way of approaching this. So as Europe really is facing this next step of integration, which is about to integrate 27 states, searching for a new vision, it is not done by generations who knew what war meant, and it's not done with the presence of an external threat. And those, I think, are very, very fundamental issues. Then comes, and I will not enter it into it, I've talked about that before, the kind of triple problems of digestion, political digestion, one, to digest that enlargement, daunting task over years, Secondly, to digest a currency which is not constructed as solidly as it should have been. And uh, thirdly, to digest a new treaty, which was born out of pain, the Lisbon Treaty, Common Security Foreign, Foreign Policy, how to make that work among the 27. That is, I believe, in a way, where we are now. And we see that the old European integration pattern where generations could kind of think that we go from fear to hope to prosperity, is being replaced by another move where we go from prosperity to uncertainty and fear about the future. This is a very changing concept and mentality about what, what will lie ahead of us. So with that in mind, Mr. President, I would say that yes, there is a crisis element because European integration is driven by underlying forces and underlying structures which are very different from those post-war years. Yes, there is a much more solid crisis to deal with. But will that lead to a crisis in integration? I think that is the open question. And I think that the answer to the challenges which Europe is now facing is so dauntingly pointing towards more integration that I think that will happen. I think it's going to pose a democratic challenge in member states because it's going to be more confusing about what, what will we vote for and, and why are we moving in this direction. But I think, you know, elections such as we saw in the Netherlands in re uh, recent days is that, you know, when it comes to the end, I think it's pretty clear for people that this idea that we could just pull out of this, you know, it will unfold as clear, that idea is false. I think there's still that much knowledge left in the European political body. But in addition to facing a banking union challenge, dealing with the banking crisis, in addition to getting these different crisis funds established to deal with public funding, there's a third challenge in Europe, which I think have been underestimated, and that is the fundamental mortal challenge to the welfare state. We are about to witness a complete change in the concept of the European welfare state. And for those of you who saw the news yesterday on Norwegian television about Spain, that's just one illustration about what happens to uh, the young people who fall out of work and fall out of social systems and welfare systems. I think we see an illustration of that. 
The Norwegian welfare state, we are proud of it. I think it's a part of a Nordic concept, but it is basically a European concept. The first ideas of pooling responsibility in a welfare state did not come out of Norway. It came out of deep European uh, uh, trends. Germany, Britain, and so on. This whole model is now under severe pressure, which I believe is going to lead Europe to more a kind of creating new divides, uh, which are not necessarily east-west, but rather north-south. And part of it is not driven out of ideology, which is normally a fair game. You know, my political party wants a different direction and vote for me. But this is driven out of necessity, and in some instances, added to that a political drive, that my political party will take advantage of this necessity and try to do something which I ideologically defend. But the driving force of changing European welfare states now is obviously the deficits and the debt and the cuts which just have to be carried out. This is a fundamental thing, which, in my view, is going to raise a very interesting debate in Europe, which is the debate about the role of the state. And where I personally believe, and here again I, I lead to lean on Tony Jutt, the historian, who, who wrote his history of Europe in the 20th century up until 90, the late 90s, and he called that book post-war. And his idea in, in, in one of the most brilliant <coughs> history books I have ever read, and I recommend it to those of you who haven't read it, is that the Balkan Wars are part of post-war Europe. Again, that's when history comes to haunt Europe. It's still lying there, still coming, floating up. But Europe has seen the state as more a problem than an opportunity since the late 70s, early 80s. Since, in a way, the Reagan-Thatcher years in ideological terms, but also because the state needed fundamental reforms coming out of stagflation years of the 70s and 80s. I think we see a different story now when we see the vulnerability of a society when state funding and finances End up, uh, end up in trouble and are put, in risk, put at risk. And the concept which we have seen in some states that you can somehow have American tax level and European welfare system, at the end, it simply doesn't work. So I think, you know, for those countries who have been able to preserve a very solid public funding as a buffer in these very shifting times, will stand better chances to go through these turbulent years. And I've, I've repeated that sometimes. You know, I remember in the early 90s when I traveled around with, with my prime minister at the time, we were always told that this way you are organized in Norway is not going to survive this globalization and this globalized world because your state is too big, your taxes are too high, your unions are too strong. Now, it ends up with interest to see that experts, not only political you know, friends or foes, come to observe that Nordic welfare states basically do better. Probably because they had a very solid funding and because they are pretty good tax collectors. I think one of the interesting things we experience now through EEA cooperation is that one thing we can offer to countries which are struggling is to build, you know, a tax collecting system which has legitimacy and efficiency. But that is somewhat a different story. Now, ending up with one reflection. I believe, I cannot say, you know, the recipe, I'm too, on too much of a distance, but I think European integration is going to make a huge leap forward. A huge leap forward. Because it's the way, only way to, to conceptualize and materialize the interdependence which is on this continent. It's going to be a daunting task for politicians to explain this, why it's necessary, because it's still in European democracy this way that politicians are being judged at home, not in Brussels. With all respect to the European Parliament, it is not the test of legitimacy, those elections. The test happens in national elections around. And for politicians to have, and parties for, to have that position where they can explain and gain the fundamental need of legitimacy for this process, that's going to be a big challenge. But I think it will be a major leap forward. Norway in all of this, 
Well, I think that Norway's interest will be served with the same analysis as it was really in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And since the EEA agreement by five parliaments and six governments that we are fundamentally served to have level playing field. And then we have had debates on whether we should be members or not, and we have opted twice not to be. But I think the analysis that there is level playing field in the economy, in the way we circulate as people, engaged as researchers, as students, I think it's pretty solid. And with that basis, and given what European integration may go through in the next 5, 10, 15 years, I think European Norwegian politicians would be not doing their job if they did not continuously consider what are our best options to relate politically to this cooperation. Will we see a Europe in somewhat more kind of two speeds? Will there be north-south divides? What will be the reality of what I see as a very interesting trend of the sub-regional pattern of cooperation? As we, for example, experience in the Arctic, Barents, Nordic, Baltic uh, family, and as they see at other parts uh, in Europe. What will come out of these structures and how will we relate to them? Now, finally, Europe on this world stage. What I have really observed over these last years as, as foreign minister is the, it's the drama, in a way, if Europe is too weak on the world stage. The idea of Lisbon Treaty was to make a clearer European voice at the world stage. I don't see it that way. Or let me put it this way, not yet. And I appreciate that my, my, my good friend, Lady Ashton, who is leading these external action services, has a daunting job to get that services up and going. And you just have to accept that, you know, it's almost about getting the buildings and the furniture and the structures and the procedures. And while doing that, she's going to deal with 27 states and with their internal uh, issues going on. But we in Norway fundamentally need a strong Europe at that world stage because we may have differences on absolutely minute minor issues. But when it comes to dealing with momentum on trade, when it comes to dealing with issues in the Human Rights Council of the United Nations, when it comes to dealing with issues in disarmament, if it hadn't been for European partners and NATO allies, we would not have secured the convention to ban cluster munitions. More than 20 of our NATO allies supported that convention because they thought like we. And we are not going to deal in all those global arenas if we don't have them there. It was a shocking fact to me. I went to Kampala in Uganda to mark the ICC, the tribunal, a couple of years ago. And there was no Europe speaking there. Here's the fundamental thing of, you know, rule of law at the global level, critically important against impunity, core European value. But there we came in a situation that it was neither a European minister nor Brussels. So from that perspective, I really hope that, uh, that uh, the efforts to strengthen that service uh, moves, ahead, uh, moves forward and that we will see uh, more Europe at the, European scene, at the global scene. It is profoundly in Norway's interest. Then, it is true that Europe is like a kaleidoscope. You can turn it around, see different images, different pasts and different futures. And the fascinating study of history is that history will always come with some surprise. So I think that is uh, the, the end of my take. But I will end by saying that no, I don't think there is a crisis to this integration. To the contrary, it's probably the solution. And on Norway, we should keep watching out. Thank you. Be ready to take some uh, Clear. questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much for a uh, very inter interesting speech. Uh, and also uh, nice that you could pick up a few points where you could uh, criticize me. And uh, <laughs> I'm happy to return to some of those points. But now we open up for, for uh, some questions uh, and remarks. I guess uh, we have some microphones, uh, Liv. Uh, so if you could please raise your hand and... Uh, and uh, yeah, 
So over here, first. But can I just say one, I have one question first, uh, Jonas. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, that um, on the one hand, you say that there is no crisis and you expect some uh, uh, gigantic leaps in integration. These driven some out, out of necessity. But at the same time, you said that the politicians will have a hard time to convince their citizens and voters. Of course, you pointed to, to the recent Dutch elections. But uh, apart from the Dutch elections, most politicians have, have had a hard time to be re-elected. So uh, how do you see the connection between the integ integration leaping forward and on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, citizens uh, that are increasingly frustrated, want to give uh, to protest, and, and, uh, and uh, also raises question about the whole solidarity, etc., in Europe. So, so could you say a few more words about this? Uh, and this is, of course, uh, and another part of that story is that this is not, of course, uh, not a single country issue. It's that you could imagine that in certain countries, uh, there will be more protest and opposition than in other countries, and that is potentially destabilizing the process. Listen to carefully to, to, to what I said. You know, I really don't underestimate the difficulty in this. No, I, I, and I don't underestimate the crisis that Europe is going through, which is a complex financial political crisis. I'm just trying to be precise about the words. Is it the integration itself that is in crisis? What is cause effect here? Mm. Are politicians having a hard time carrying this through, moving forward? God knows. Yes, absolutely. Uh, will we see 27 member states, 17 member states of the euro five years from now? Perhaps not. You know, I, I will never forget when I, as a young journalist, interviewed Vladimir Bukovsky, the Soviet dissident who had just come out from Gulag, and he said in his interview with me, by, two, by 2000 the Soviet Union will be gone. And I went home to write out that article and said, you know, can, can I even write this? <laughs> If you, well, if you've been in the gulag, you probably get these ideas, I can understand. <laughs> now, he was wrong. It happened in 1990, five years after. So God knows there will be surprises, fundamental surprises. Mm -hmm. But my point is this. I have seen no recipe, proposal, vision for how you would turn integration around and move the other way. If it's not for failure, if it's not for failure, you know, that we just insolvent, broke, we are out. And that scenario is such that, I mean, we know there are countries in Europe who would have been extremely tempted to do that if that was a quick solution. And the fact that it isn't, for pretty obvious reasons, keep them on in that integration. And I think we in Norway sometimes underestimate the enormous efforts those other member states are doing to keep it floating and keep it move forward. But I think, you know, there are psychologically, sociologically, some profound differences to the other leaps in integration. Where you, it's true, it's often said that, you know, Europe integrates on the basis of crisis. But that is a kind of crisis which is more out of, if we don't move now, we will be in a less fortunate position to deal with this issue. For example, stagflation. We have high inflation and unemployment, late 70s, early 80s. But we have a proposal. If we do the internal market and do da take down barriers to trade and you have to drive through Europe and stop at every border to declare your goods, we could improve efficiency of this economy. So there was a vision that if we do this, we may move forward, which I think was the result. This time around, there's another profound motivation for integration, which is that if we don't do this, we will really end up in, in, a, in a mess, which is not a very encouraging message. I mean, you cannot scare voters in the long run into things. Hmm. So I think uh, uh, clearly, if you add up to them, you know, new generations. I remember one thing. I mean, this is a personal experience. I was director general at the international department uh, at the prime minister's office. And I accompanied Kjell Magne Bonnevik, who was the prime minister, to Berlin. No, to Bonn, sorry. To Bonn, to meet the German chancellor. And uh, uh, that was then, you know, uh, Helmut Kohl in, 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 in his final years. 
and he had done reunification, he had done the, the, the DMARC, and he spoke. For that whole hour, he spoke most of the time about precisely what I, uh, Timothy Garton Ash exemplifies, that, that I am the last generation. And he used these words, which, you know, when you read them in, his, in Garton Ash's article, uh, Kohl used this word. He said, remember, I'm the first German chancellor since Hitler of a unified Germany. I'm the first leader of, of a unified Germany since those horrendous years. I mean, this was in the man's political body. Mm. He said, I'm the direct successor of Hitler. Well, <laughs> <laughs> which is even better, you know, <laughs> to explain the drama of this. But he knew he would be the last of that generation. Mitterrand was dead. He was still there on his way out. And sometimes we underestimate. Now it's my generation, you know, kind of, born in the 50s or in the 60s, who are, you know, born on the heels of, of these achievements, and we are looking forward in, into it. I think, you know, in political science, we are sometimes underestimating the role of the cohorts. When did you shape your worldview? Before, just after the World War, before or after the end of the Cold War, and I've said this many times on the High North, are we shaped by the Cold War maps when we analyze relations in the Arctic in the, in the High North, or do we allow ourselves to think that there are some new concepts? Okay, th thank you very much. Please. Um, my name is uh, Kirsti Metti. I'm from the European Movement in Norway. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for a very interesting analysis, very wise and full of insight. Um, when you talk about Norway's relationship with, uh, with the EU, um, basically it was the level, level playing field uh, that is the central part, the, the commercial aspect of our rela relationship uh, with, with Europe. Why do you think that uh, our relationship is basically such a commercial one? We seem to look at uh, Nor the EU just like a big market more than a political project. Why is it that we lack the complete political vision about our place in Europe? Well, this is a big analysis, but you, in my view, you are wrong on one point. Level playing field is not about commercial only. To me, it's profoundly much more. Because the level playing field is about human. It's, it's a human thing that you are treated with the same rights and obligations in numerous fields. And God knows that our inside-outside agreements with the European Union is about people. Yes, if you run a company, you have the same rights and obligations as a company from Porto or from Rome or from Krakow. And if you are, those rights are infringed upon, you can go to a court. That is, that is business. But if you are a student, if you are a student if you are a researcher, if you are a patient, you also have equal rights. And to me, it's really, for me, it's such a core thing of, of European identity of which we are a part, because these rights are shaped by the rule of law, basically anchored in deep European human rights. You know, I've always said that under the circumstances, the EEA is also, from a security policy point of view, extremely important because it is this platform for the economic foundation. And you don't have to be on the right or on the left to see that the economic foundation of a society also determines its values in much broader sense. So, you know, the level playing field is also about that, in my view. Uh, and then I think uh, we should not open that chapter now, but why then not the whole thing? Well, you know, the more I've seen, the more I can, although I did not vote against, I can, I can see and explain, because it's been my role over the years to explain to European partners why that is so. And, and, and then, you know, I normally take out the map to explain the reality uh, uh, about this Europe, which is shaped and thought through in continental capitals, and which never in its articulation really grasped what it meant to live north of that continent. But that will take another ten minutes, but I think that, that is a is a fundamental thing, but not altering the fact uh, of the level playing field. That is why, for example, we are now very solidly at peer with the European Union on Arctic issues. It didn't take lobbying from Norway's side, it took connecting to our common roots. We want to respect the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. 
We want to cooperate on research. So these are fundamental European principles, which is also a level playing field. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then there's a question down here. Leave. Yeah. Third row. It's a very quiet uh, gathering here, so I cannot My see. My name is Hallo Johansson. I'm an, I'm an concerned elderly. And thank you very much to the Foreign Minister for an excellent lecture. You were touching on many aspects of the future of European integration, and um, in particular the, the, the increasing strength of Northern Europe and the problems of Southern Europe, the haves and the have-nots. What kind of political means do you see necessary being applied in order to even out? Because I would think that the condition for future success in Europe is that the dividing line between, between the successful North and the not so successful South vanish? Well, you know, I think Europe has in its inherent body uh, um, many potential dividing lines. But in the heart and intellect of Europe, there should be a constant awareness to fight dividing lines, because we know that they can be bad. That's my first point. Second point, I think that still, with this Europe that leaped, remember, I come back to this, from an ideally thought through 12 countries who would do deepening. And I remember the President of the European Commission told the Norwegian Prime Minister that, you know, we do the EA with you, and we do our deepening, and then in 10 years' time, you can come around and see, perhaps. And these were even the EFTA states that were so similar so easy to connect, easier to connect than many of the existing member states, even among the 12. Um, but the concept of 12, now they are 27, with the currency and with, 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 with the failings of the way constructions have been built, has to be repaired in some way. In that exercise, I think we are going to see a lot of you know, potential fractures, potential dividing lines, potential new lines. Coupled with that on the security side, Norway and the United States are the only countries now, as I read, who are not cutting their defense budgets. And I see no immediate reason why any European state at the moment should do that. Not that I see another threat which is saying, you know, let's increase. But I think, you know, the idea that also this area is being hit by the financial crisis, taking decisions which are not nearly necessarily thought through because it's a political desire to reduce this budget, but it's, it's done out of necessity, illustrates to me that some of the foundations of how Europe is organized today may go through changes. That's one reason why I, as a foreign minister for seven years, have been very strongly arguing for a deeper Nordic cooperation in the areas which are relevant for Nordic cooperation. I have been very actively trying to push Arctic, Barents, Baltic, Nordic cooperation as a sub-regional structure which can gain relevance, and always, you know, relevance which fits with our other obligations, be they EU or NATO. And I think what is emerging is a much clearer reading of common interests among these states who will go deeper in cooperation without infringing on their obligations towards NATO or towards uh, the EU, rather add on to the cultural cooperation in Europe. So, you know, uh, we can do that without uh, creating dividing lines, uh, and I think more of that will and should happen. Okay, we have a few more people on the list. Uh, Liv, uh, over here, to Dag, over here. Uh, and then... But before Doug takes the floor, yeah, now go ahead. Yeah, my name is uh, Doug Seierstad. Um, I felt in your introduction that you are very aware of fundamental dilemmas. Uh, I'm sure you are right that on the elite level, uh, the necessity of more integration is felt very strongly. Uh, on the other side, uh, among European citizens in different countries, they may be less 
integrated and less hoping for integration than for many, many years. So I think it's necessary to specify, as I think more integration, <laughs> uh, political, economic integration, could lead to less integration of citizens. Uh, so it's necessary to specify in what way is this integration produced and in what fields uh, will more integration uh, solve dilemmas of that. I, I felt that was an underlying theme in your introduction. Yeah. And I don't expect you to specify this now, but we have to come back to it. Voluntarily. And we, we, we certainly will. But it's a good question, Doug. Because what you point to is right. And although I, I've always felt, you know, labeling this kind of elite and people thing makes, takes us away a bit from the issues, but fair enough, let's do that. In the sense that the integration debate which goes on in Brussels and has to go on in Brussels creates an even increased, more increased distance to people. To me, is that a failure of integration? In some instances. Because I think, frankly speaking, with all respect to that very important institution, the European Parliament, is that the Parliament's idea, when it was created and it would have direct election, was that that would do the trick. And when I come to Brussels, I feel that people live on the illusion that the fact that that Parliament exists, with all these MPs who come there no longer with their national identities, but they belong to different party groups, uh, that's happening. I don't see any debate of that when I travel, you know to Sweden, Denmark, Hungary, that the European Parliament debate is kind of lively integrated at the national level. I think that's a challenge. So you are right about that. But that is a huge political challenge for governments and national parliaments and national democracies. Because what are we talking about here? Who can save Europe's banks? Who can save Europe's banks? In my view, only a banking union. And I think they're doing about the right things. And if they don't do that, those banks are going to collapse because they are very fragile. And who will pay the price? Those people. People back home. Because the economy will dry out, dry up. So if you are a national government in country X, and you have these vulnerable banks, and we can talk about the reasons why that happened, but that's the reality, how do you assume your responsibility? by pulling out of this European integration, saying we'll fix it ourselves? Who, who is arguing for that? Will that lead anywhere? No, they have to go back to that pooled responsibility in one way or another. The other thing at stake, more important than banks, is states. States are about to collapse. Their funding is about to collapse. They are found about to go broke for every, every purpose. Where should they turn? And that's why I think you know, elections in Greece produced something very horrible. But still, it produced by its large majority a, 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 a willingness to, you know, do what it takes to live up to some standards. And to save that economy, it will also happen through a combination of what they can get in Europe and what they can get through the IMF, and Norway will take its part of that. But this then amounts to a huge task for politicians at home to explain why this is so. And I think, you know, to be honest, and I've ob been observing it, so, and since I've been at a distance, I, 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 I'm fully aware that I'm maybe ignorant on some of this, that part of the Euro speak, part of the treaty speak, has created the assumption that with the parliament and with the new processes in Brussels and consultations back and forth and, you know, all these things, we are taking care of anchoring legitimacy and, you know, selling in. That was wrong. Didn't work. I'm, I'm very critical of that, you know, when, when, I, when, when, I, when I travel around. Because the source of legitimacy is still at home. Governments at home. So they have to go home and do that homework there and do the explanation and do the debate and do the talking and all of that. You know, there was this classic article by Swedish. Uh, he said, how to preserve the democratic deficit in the EU, he always argued how to keep it democracy at the national level, not mess it up at the European level, how to preserve the democratic deficit. Uh, that's, uh, and then there's a question here. Mm -hmm. 
Strin Eklund from the Norwegian Peace Organization. You, uh, first of all, thanks for your optimism. It's nice to hear that somebody is very optimistic about the crisis in Europe. Uh, you partly uh, answered my question. I would like to ask you if you were in the shoes of Angela Merkel or had power in Brussels, what would you have liked to do differently uh, about the crisis in South Europe? And I also wonder what is going to happen to Italy? Have you any idea if the crisis also will reach uh, Italy and what then? Thank you. You know, some questions are really high risk to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, to try to fit these into Angela Merkel's shoes will be a, a pretty daunting experience. And with an Italian uh, servant of the EU after me, who am I? <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know, I, I will respectfully say that I cannot stand as a foreign minister and teach any lesson to the German Chancellor. I think that sometimes in our debate we are saying, you know, the, German, the Germans have to pay. But we say that without going back and say, how much have they paid? How much have they made available already through this financial mechanism? So that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that I think, you know, the underlying part of this banking crisis and also sovereign crisis, states having debts, it's not being debated, and that is who lended money to these states. And normally, if you run a company and you come into problems, you, you, you have a kind of debate with those who lended money, you know, to take responsibility. I think that's part of hard politics in Europe, which, which is not alway, always uh, uh, really de debated, because those who lended money were as keen not to see uh, this go wrong for their reasons, not necessarily for, 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 for the lender. Uh, uh, so that was the first question. About Italy, well, I mean, uh, I will not go into that. I think, you know, when people talk about Italy and they say, look, at, they have a technocrat government. And I, I, g I gave a lecture about this at the University of Oslo, which said, well, yes, they did so. But it, was, it wasn't a coup. It was... Parliament governments, uh, uh, parliament parties who decided that we want these people to represent us in the next phase. And every piece of legislation that government has passed on budget or reform or whatever has pa been passed through parliament. But the fact that both Greece and Italy had to succumb to, to this action of political parties being elected, retreating to let technocrats in, is of course a telling sign a following up on my previous analysis, which is that problems is at home, challenge is at home. That's where you have to deal with it. And that's where voters will keep Europe accountable. It will continue to keep Europe accountable in 27 different settings, not in the one which is Brussels. Okay, I see. I think we are running a bit late and you probably have a busy schedule. So I think on this note, we had to just thank you very much, uh, Jonas, for uh, giving this very interesting and rich uh, personal reflections, but also uh, laying out some reflections on Europe and also Norway's Europe policy. I think this was very good. And also thank you for taking time to, to uh, respond to questions, etc. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.